Well, hello, everybody. Here we are, end of October. I can't believe it. Um, we're going to be in 2024 before we know it. Um, let's go ahead and officially call the meeting to order. And if Mindy would do roll call to get us started, that'd be great. Ada Anderson? Here. Andrew Suhaka? Here. Barbara Boyer? Here. Kathy Noon? She's here. She's just muted. Chris Lynn? Here. Good morning. Connie Ward? Dave Appel? Here. Don Perez? Ed Moss? Here. George Teal? We know Carrie is here. Perla Geller? Bill Cernanic? Present. Sean Wood? Sherry Haight Vogel? Present. Sharon Tessier? Steve Conklin? Good morning. Tex Elam? Here. Tom Mahowald? Valerie Robson? And Wynn said she'd be late too, so. And Val is here. Did you see that, Mindy? Yeah. She's just muted. Okay. And there are several Dr. Cog staff. Do we have any guests present? I saw Debbie Haney. Debbie Haney, Castle Rock Senior Center. Hi, Debbie. Hey, guys. <laughs> Good to see y'all. Jennifer D'Ambrosio with Douglas County. Oh, Jennifer's on. Hi, Jennifer. Hello. And Allison Cutting with Douglas County. Well, We're lurking. Allison, look at <laughs> Douglas County guests. I love it. Mary, <laughs> you're, you're stalking the area. <laughs> I am. I'm trying to take over. Okay, wonderful. Do uh, you, want text, you know, this you is can the if you want. <laughs> in the ballot box. What was that, Phil? Well, I was trying. I, I was telling Tex that this is the season for stuffing the ballot box. Yeah, right. <laughs> hey, let's not go there, please. <laughs> I'm not on my meeting. Okay. Um. All right. Uh, did you want staff to introduce themselves, or are we just saying we have several staff? I think we have several staff. We have quite a few. Take okay. a while. That's wonderful. All right. Well, welcome again, everyone. Do we have any public comment? No, no public comment. Um, I don't have so much as a report as I would like to mention, though, before we officially started the meeting, there were two comments made about social isolation. And I think it's worth mentioning what a very significant issue social isolation is, particularly with older adults. We know it's a national pandemic um, right now declared by our Surgeon General. It affects all ages, but the population most at risk is our older adults. A few things that I learned recently, and many of you may know this, um, We've heard for years that social isolation and chronic loneliness can be more detrimental to your health than smoking 15 cigarettes a day, having six alcoholic beverages. It is worse than being obese. And something new I learned from the Surgeon General's report was that it can increase your risk of getting dementia by almost by up to 50%. It is not something to be taken lightly. And I know this group doesn't, 
but I feel like it's all of our duties to share these stats with other people who may not know. Not only is it good for the older adults, it also points to how important it is to receive social companion type funding at a federal level. And I know that's been on Jayla's radar for several years. So that is my report. Um, if you want to call it that, and I'd like to invite Jayla now to give her report. Well, good morning, everyone. So glad that you're here this morning. Very uh, cold and uh, sucked in at my house. So uh, it's coming your way. Uh, I just have a few things that I wanted to tell you about. I attended a conference called the conversation with the Colorado Department of Healthcare Policy and Finance. Um, with AJ uh, last week, it, it was about healthcare reform in Colorado. They identified ch challenges. There are a multitude of challenges. I think the number, well, there are three that, that kind of popped up. Um, workforce issues in healthcare, huge, huge problem. They talked about having the state of Colorado needing 13,500 nurses. Um, and over 54,000 ancillary positions vacant in the state. So that's like techs and CNAs and, um, you know, lab techs and uh, uh, radiation techs, all those kind of folks. Um, really a lot of talk about um, the challenges of workforce and what people are thinking about. They're doesn't seem to be any quick solutions right now. One of the things that we know, um, so, so important, if you're going to the hospital, having someone there with you um, and visiting often to just make sure that things get done the way they're supposed to, and is someone to run down the hall if, if um, you don't get your medication or uh, is, is very important. Rural health services. So if you can imagine the challenges we're having in the metropolitan area, think about what's happening in our rural health uh, service area. There are providers uh, that are closing their doors. Um, there are hospitals that are struggling to uh, uh, get staff. Uh, staff are working multiple different kinds of jobs uh, just to keep the doors open. Very challenging. And then the next kind of big topic, uh, uh, behavioral health. It is all about behavioral health right now. Also, I don't know when we switch from behavior or from mental health to behavioral health, but they mean the same thing. They don't mean the same thing to me. Mental health has always meant like, to me, the way I learned it is like, you know, bipolar disorder, schizoaffective disorder. And then behavioral health were things like um, hoarding and behaviors that went along with that. But it seems to have been encompassed all into what they call behavioral health now. Um, and that certainly is a priority. Talked a lot about um, child uh, um, behavioral health um, and, and where we're at with children. Um, a lot of, you know, a lot of need in, in uh, behavioral health for children. Um, there was not much talk about older adults at all. And I mentioned it in every single uh, session I went to. Uh, I stood up by the end of the conference. They were like, okay, what are you going to say about older adults? But, you know, it was just once again, shocking to me that this is one of the fastest uh, aging states in the nation, that this is our fastest growing segment of the population. And Hick Puff did not talk about it in any significant way. Um, very, very frustrating. Um, but AJ and I did our best to uh, talk about aging and remind people once again, and I got to say this to the director of Medicaid herself, um, when I talked about, she was talking about, uh, being able to provide social determinants of health, transportation, nutrition services. And she was very proud of that to people. And she talked about families and children and 
didn't say one single word about older adults. And I said, you know, you're missing one very important component of families and that's the grandparents in those families. And you haven't talked much about those folks. And she said, and I, and then she's, I, I said, you know, at, you're not paying for the services you're paying for hospitals. She described beautifully how hospitals are being able to refer to community-based services. And then I said, yeah, but you're not paying the service providers to provide that service. And then she went on about, oh, we passed this law last year that allows hospital to use, uh, uh, to use their community benefit dollars. And that's how we're gonna pay for services. And I said, yes, yes, that is wonderful. And we were hoping that too, but it's not really coming forth the way there's so many community needs. Well, if you just meet with them, I'm sure they'll fund your services. No, uh, not as easy as that. And I was able to remind her also that, um, you know, my famous saying, um, referrals don't change health, health outcomes services do. I had lots of people come up to me afterwards, thanking me for bringing up older adults and also for saying that about services change health outcomes. Jayla? Yeah. This, this is Phil. Uh -huh. uh, I'll let, I'll, I'll, I'll hand this up uh, or I'll tee it up for AJ to make a comment at one point in time. I'm terrifically disappointed because I had been sitting on the HTP as the hospital transfer program, which is this money that the director is talking about and there's a citizen advisory committee and uh, they had three years to kind of work with the staff and such to set some measures so that there could be some accountability around the HTP and they have now suspended the citizen advisory group and uh, if AJ wants to make any more comments but um, in addition to that uh, the uh, provisions and infrastructure that was put in the legislation that she refers to has been disrupted. I'll I'll use that word because uh, it's kind of kind. Yeah, that, it, not great news for us. We were hoping um, that that would be an option, and the fact that she brings it up as an option um, is premature well i don't know what it is it's it's uninformed i guess um and yeah well there's more to come on that i'm sure we have more advocacy in that area uh i along with um rich asked uh aaron fisher and christine who's the AAA director of uh in the summit area vintage AAA uh in summit county uh, and Christine Vogel, who's the AAA director in Boulder, and myself to uh, meet with the Colorado Center on Aging uh, to talk about our funding request to the governor and the status and our advocacy and just answer their questions and explain, you know, where we're coming from um, and also thank them for their support because they do support us. Um, it was uh, very nice to be able to explain in more detail how serious of an issue this is um, and how it means, particularly in the metropolitan area, um, that services are, are going to be limited dramatically if we don't get more funding. Um, Rich and I had a meeting along with our state lobbyist, Dr. Cog state lobbyist, Ed Bowditch, uh, we had a meeting with JBC staffer Tom Doherty about the funding um, situation for AAAs and our request to the governor. Um, it was a really good meeting. Uh, one thing about Tom Doherty is that he has been a staffer for quite a while now and has met with uh, us a number of times. He gave us some really good insight. He asked for more data. He said that he would like to do a briefing to uh, the state of, of uh, or, or to the JBC about this issue. I don't know, Rich, if you want to say anything else, you came on at the perfect time uh, about that, but I was really encouraged by the meeting and I felt uh, it was comforting and they knew so much about the area agencies on aging, the work that we do. And 
um, gave us some good, I think, direction on how to present our data. Uh, Jayla, I'll just add that um, I was also very encouraged um, about his interest in the issue and um, it, the, the likelihood that he would uh, raise this issue with the Joint Budget Committee members, um, which would be, uh, I think, really nice because it would tee it up for all us and all of the rest of you to follow up with our advocacy with the committee. Um, based on, I don't know, um, lack of information from the department and the governor's office in response to um, our letters and requests, um, we're not optimistic that we'll see the funding in the governor's proposed budget. I mean, I suppose you never know. <laughs> they may have decided to put something in without telling us, which often happens too. But um, right now, I'm not optimistic that we'll see anything. The budget will come out, I think it's next Wednesday. Is that right? The, on November 1st? Yeah, so, I think so. So um, I'll be looking uh, through that in detail to see if we can see anything in there. But um, we're continuing to gear up to really turn our attention heavily to the Joint Budget Committee um, over the next, you know, few weeks through the end of the year at least. Rich. Hey, Jayla, can I make a request? Yes. Uh, could you put together two, three, four bullet points and send it out to us? Because um, I think a lot of us know people who are on the Joint Budget Committee, and I just don't want to say anything wrong. <laughs> yeah, Rich, can you help me do that? Yeah, I'll let you and I work together on that. Okay. And Rich, I had a request if once you take a good look at um, the findings, could you let us know or could yeah. that be nice to yeah to have an idea if, if anything was included? Right. Absolutely. I'll give an update. I'll send an update or supply it probably to Mindy to send out. Mindy. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, one of the the you know we have we've had nimble and and it's one of the large it is the largest fall and balance prevention program in the country um with close to now 30,000 members um uh, who Dr. Cog pays for their annual membership to nimble and people utilize it and we get data on the performance and the benchmarks and it's really been a wonderful program. It is not a required program under the Older Americans Act. Well, it is, and it's one of those good to do programs, right? Um, under the new regulations that aren't re out yet, um, the ones that were done in 2020, fall prevention is a required service. Um, it's not in this current one. We are trying to figure Nimble does not want to lose all the data. The data is ours, right? Nimble does not want to lose this partnership. It is very beneficial to them as an organization. Um, they, they have another huge project, which is the, the country of New Zealand has um, a Nimble going. The, 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 the government pays for everyone to have Nimble as a fall prevention program, and they've seen the value of it. Nimble is working through NCOA to get um, the National Council on Aging to get designated as a um, evidence-based program, but they're not there yet. Um, so we are trying to figure out a way to preserve Nimble without using AAA funds. And we are having um, a meeting with Kaiser Permanente who's interested in helping us pay for Nimble. And we have had an initial meeting about this and we have uh, more to go on this, but it's kind of exciting. Um, so I, I just wanna give you a heads up that we're working on that. Um, it might be a wonderful entree into partnering with 
health care um, on a specific program. Um, they'll want us to take it statewide. I've already talked with Doug about that. He's supportive of that. He's going to be in the conversations. We're going to use um, our, we uh, managed to get uh, a, a small contract with a specialist. Her name is Tori, um, to help us develop partnerships with health payers. And we're also gonna have her in those conversations. And I'm hoping that we'll be able to put something together before we have to stop funding Nimble um, because it, it is a very valuable program that people use and like. And I get compliments on that on a regular basis. Thank you so much for paying for Nimble for us. It's, it is the strangest thing, but people do come up and tell me that. Um, so I'm glad they're happy and it's fun and, and they can tell that it's making a difference. The, the final thing I wanna talk about is um, we were hoping to have funding scenarios and I told you I was gonna have funding scenarios and Sharon and I sat down diligently and we got all our papers and all our information together. And then we're like, yeah, we can't do this. First of all, there are so many must do's in, in the Older Americans Act. Just because we don't have money doesn't mean we can't not do the requirements of the Older Americans Act, right? So we still have to fund like legal services. It's required under the Older Americans Act. So we're required to fund it at 3%. So we'll probably take it to 3%, but we have to look at all the scenarios. We also are required to open up our RFP to anyone and everyone. And then we have to set priorities after the RFP on pockets. So this is what I think we're gonna do. We're gonna have buckets of money, but there are so many variables over the next six months that it's really hard to do that. The problem is we have to do, we have to come up with these buckets for the funding RFP to go out. Right, so the RFP has to go out like in three or four weeks so that we can sustain services come July 24. And we are trying to figure out just basic how much money we're gonna put out um, for contractors. And if we, add, if we get more money, we can have, always add, but we don't wanna make sure we over promise so we're working on that right now. Unfortunately, Sharon had a family emergency and is on leave right now. Um, and so we, we're gonna have a meeting, we're gonna figure it out, but there are just so many uh, variables that I'm like, well, what about this? And what about that? And what about this? And she's like, yeah. I'm like, we can't, we can't come up with funding scenarios right now. Plus we have to have a ton of conversations with Doug and Doug's gonna be in on those conversations. Um, and then we'll bring it to you. And so hopefully we will get better grasp on this. We need to very quickly so that we can put the RFP out. And that's my report. Galen? Well, okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mindy. <laughs> uh, Jayla, your comment about partnering with healthcare providers, uh, given the um, requirements of lowering healthcare premiums uh, and for health insurance, uh, there's an opportunity window, I think, in this area. Uh, it was pointed out to me that uh, some of the carriers might be actually interested in reducing healthcare costs, not just being finance organizations because uh, they are charged with lowering premiums by certain percentages. And so uh, rather than just cutting benefits, which are the list of required benefits is extensive, uh, they don't have that much room in that space. There may be an increasing opportunity uh, to uh, partner with healthcare providers around uh, particularly those like Kaiser that also share healthcare premiums uh, in what they do, so. Yeah, there was, um, 
Yeah, thank you for that. That I think there is an opportunity. There seems to be a shift going on and it's probably because of that. We're hearing about more and more denials happening, particularly in the Medicare Advantage space. Um, and we're hearing it from clients, we're hearing it from hospitals, um, people in the hospital, they wanna do a certain procedure or a test. Um, there's a denial, the hospital feels like they can't discharge. So they uh, you know, have conversations. In the meantime, they're losing money. The hospitals are losing money because they can't get, or they're discharging people um, because the insurance is denying what the doc is saying is the best, what should be done. I don't know what's going on there, you know, because I know there's a lot of interest in, uh, I, I hope that, that insurance companies aren't in a position to deny things that are very important health decisions that the doctors are making because of, of money. But I, I feel like we might be in a situation like that. And a lot of people just don't know to appeal or how to appeal. Um, I know that our ship staff are, are working more and more in that area. Ship staff all across the state are working more and more in that area. I, I hadn't thought about that might be one of the reasons they are denying is because to reduce costs. I hadn't thought about that, but I bet you that's part of the scenario. Yeah, you um, know, Jayla, yeah. is SHIP one of the um, required funding? SHIP is a, SHIP is, yeah, it, 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 it's a little bit different. Um, so the core services are transportation, nutrition, in-home services, information assistance. Um, there's one care. more, I'm missing one more. Um, yeah. So those are the core services. And then there are must-dos. The ombudsman program is a must-do. The Colorado uh, Legal Services is a must-do. Um, and SHIP is, there's a strong partnership at the national level with SHIP and it's like a very strongly encouraged. So yes, we intend to keep our SHIP program. Um, so important. That program yeah, it is. is it very is. important. So good. I just wanted to make sure. Okay. Is that the end of your report? Jenna? That is the end of my report. Yes. Okay. Gary, um, I just wanted to let you know that both Perla and Don are in Mexico and they tried to get on, but they cannot from Mexico. Oh, they having a party without us. They must be. Darn so. it. <laughs> and I see that Winshaw has joined us. Yes. Welcome, Win. Thank okay. you. All right. Well, thanks for that, Mindy. Um, so let's uh, move to approve the consent agenda. Um, we want to have any... Is there any discussion around the minutes or changes? I'd make a motion to approve. Second. All in, no, any opposed? I forget, any opposed? Okay, so moved. I think we need to talk about our upcoming, me our upcoming meeting. The way the calendar is falling, I believe our meeting would be the day after Thanksgiving. And I know you don't want to get on this Zoom call the day after Thanksgiving. We'll all be stuffed and doing- I'm on the phone, guys. This is Perla. I'm on oh. the phone. I was able to get oh, in cool. on my phone. Welcome, Perla. Dedicated Good. person. Good. <laughs> so we were um, thinking what we could do is we could, I know we generally forego the December meeting, but what we could do is try and meet, combine the November and December meeting. And it looks like, um, was there a certain date, Mindy, we were shooting for, for the December meeting? Friday, December 1st. Friday, December 1st. That way we're not getting too much into the holiday season and um, what do people think about doing that? So what we would do is not have a November meeting and we would have a December 1st meeting. Then we would not meet again until January. Thoughts? It's not available on that date. Um, 
just to let you know, there there's going to be some approval, funding approval, and, and that's one of the reasons why we need to meet in December before the Dr. Cog board meets. Yeah, we do need to meet because the November meeting is is not going to happen. So um, can you can you take some uh, if you don't have a quorum, Terry, um, can you take votes um, via email or such? Uh, because um, I don't know, like other folks, I know we have uh, travel plans in early December as well. Okay, well, let's get a sense of who might be available for that December 1st meeting. Can I see a show of hands? One, two, three, four, five, six... Welcome, Commissioner Teal. I see he's joined us and is available. There's a lot of you that I cannot see. It looks like a lot of folks are available, Mindy. Yeah, I think we'll be okay. I think we'll be all right, too. So let's go ahead and plan on that December 1st meeting. And I know it doesn't work for everybody, but if we can have a quorum, I think we better go ahead and do that. Okay, perfect. Okay, we have um, the lovely Kelly Roberts coming up next to share with Mary. us. Yes. Text. Uh, why aren't we talking about doing annually what you were talking about a minute ago? Every November and December, we have problems in setting meetings. Okay. And since that's the case, why don't we talk about the fact that having an early December meeting combining the two meetings would be a, a way of solving that problem with the recognition that there will be occasions when special meetings will need to be provided for financial discussions separately. Well, I think that's a great idea, Tex. And I think the next time Bob and I meet with Jayla, um, we can we can discuss that further. But I think that's a great suggestion. Thank you. Okay, Kelly, would you like to share with us now? Um, some updates on the work session. I would love to share with you now, and I am prepared to share with you now. <laughs> um, so for those of you who weren't at the September 22nd in-person ACA meeting, I'll just give you a little bit of background about what we did that day. So at least half of that meeting was focused on advocacy and getting input from ACA members on our efforts to uh, conduct a public awareness campaign and also a, a flyer that we've been working on to launch that campaign. So um, we, we did that, we were in person. It was great to be in person. It was great to eat good food that Mindy ordered for us that day. And so what I'm going to do is uh, report to you on what's occurred since you provided your input. Um, we focus, first of all, on the flyer that, that we're uh, conducting. And, and I, I just want to do a, a shout out to a couple of people. Number one, to Carrie, because Carrie, you mentioned to a very uh, important person when it comes to our outreach um, that you felt the input from the ACA was really productive and, and that really paved the way to getting a chance to make the case for doing quite an extreme makeover of the flyer. And then I also really want to thank Ed Moss for sharing a very lengthy um, email with tips about, about yeah. outreach and publications because of his public relations background and expertise. So 
Jen Reeves and I uh, spent time basically integrating all of your input and looking at how to change um, the flyer. So the flyer is gonna look really different the next time you see it. We, another thing that we paid attention to was, Carrie, you had said when you looked at the flyer, it was missing some heart. So we really kind of focused the flyer, the two pages, the one page is very heart focused and the other, the other page is um, demographics and statistics and cost comparisons. So on that, on that heart page, we are very fortunate to have gotten a really wonderful client story from Project Angel Heart. And their client was very willing to share her story and her photograph that we can use on the flyer to really shine a light on just how critical and how much it matters for somebody to re receive services and how it changes their life. And her story absolutely does that. And I don't know about you all, but I'm getting really tired of stock images that are used on aging publications. So this, the photo of, of this client, she's in her kitchen with all her stuff on the walls and and holding the food that she received from Project Angel Heart. I mean, it's just a real wonderful, genuine picture. Um, and then on the demographic side of, of it, we've got, you know, data on the population growth over the next uh, 30 years. We talk about the budget cliff that's coming and the fact that funding has been stable since 2019. And then we do some cost comparisons between what it costs for a person to get community-based services per year compared to staying in a nursing home per year or being at home and receiving Medicaid programs. So, you know, that headline is fund community-based services and save the state and individuals money that by keeping people out of Medicaid. I mean, we're going bold on this. And that was another thing that you encouraged us to do was go bold. And, and so we're doing that. We're using uh, the headline of, of um, let's see, that Coloradans, Older Coloradans are in peril due to lack of funding. So it, it really is being um, revamped, revised. Uh, I met with Steve yesterday and it's looking like the flyer will go to our communications and marketing team to actually format it and um, add you know, the picture and, and the information that we want in it so that it looks good. So our goal is to have the flyer done by early or mid-November at the latest. And I will share with you <laughs> my metaphor for doing this flyer. I went to a movie yesterday. I saw the Diana Nyad movie where it's pretty, pretty remarkable movie where they portray Diana Nyad in the ocean. Her lifelong goal was to swim from Cuba to Florida. And she made like five or six attempts over five or six decades. And she finally did it when she was 64. Well, I feel like <laughs> we are going to get to Florida with this flyer at this point. Um, it's when you involve a lot of people in that kind of input, it, it just takes time, but I think it's been worth it. And, and I feel like this flyer is really gonna set the stage for other materials that we will produce related to the, to the campaign. So I'm feeling good about that, feeling good about getting my feet on the sands of Florida, <laughs> having accomplished my mission. Um, and so we also got your input and suggestions about what you would like in a toolkit so that in essence, come January, 
we can give you access to tools and information that will enable you to turn around and, and advocate in your communities. And, and you were really clear that you want to be really uh, supported to do that so that you have kind of what, like what Ed Moss said earlier today, you want a scripted elevator speech. So we're gonna come up with that. Um, we're going to come up with a, a flyer that will be a template that we can share with our contractors. So it will have some of that information that's in the, the main flyer, but there will be room for our contractors to customize and put information and their logos on them about their services. So that's something that I think will be really helpful to our contractors. Um, we are going to develop a social media campaign. Again, another suggestion you had for that was to come up with monthly themes for that. So that's something that we're going to develop. And then kind of a, just some template and suggestions for how to conduct your communications with elected officials. Um, you know, you have to find a balance between giving people uh, some information and suggestions, but you don't want those to sound canned. So we're gonna try to come up with something that uh, is, a, is a hybrid of both of those. So you have the information, but you also know that there's a space for you to put your um, concerns and, and what you wanna say, your messaging in your own words. Um, we had a contractor's training this week. The room was full of all of our contractors. It was so incredibly um, moving, really, to take the time that all of our contractors got to share what they do, what their services are. And um, it, it's, it's, Jayla said she almost cried a couple of times, you know, it's just, and when we think about maybe having to cut back on those services. Um, it's it's um, really pretty intense. But as a result of that, they are all standing by at this point. I think they're much more motivated now to give us more client stories that we can use for the campaign. So we're going to be um, uh, reminding that of them of that in an email next week. And I, I have kind of a client storytelling toolkit to give them. Uh, another idea that came up is a lot of you, a lot of our contractors have videos. For instance, Carrie, you have your video. And we actually are, Steve said that it might be possible to collect all the videos that are available from our contractors and then do excerpts from them so that then we can create kind of a collage video of a spectrum of our contractors and we don't have to start from scratch. So, I mean, there's tele technical challenges to doing that, but we're definitely going to take a look at that. I love that idea, Kelly. Yeah. What a way to tell a story from each individual region and service provider. Mm -hmm. And that is part of this heart telling story too. I just, the work that you have led the group to accomplish is outstanding. I am so excited about the work that, that um, you have led us to do because really we needed somebody to lead us, Kelly, and you have done that really well. Uh, so I'm just thrilled to see all the different um, outcomes. And I think going back to what Ed said earlier, for us to have in our hands, a small blueprint of the same verbiage throughout the providers throughout the region is really important, because we all want to go to our local electeds, because they their heart is where we're serving. And having that information is really going to empower our providers. I'm thrilled. Yeah, I mean, we really, I mean, the whole point of this is to have as many voices speaking out about what 
about yeah. this crisis, about this crisis for funding. And uh, so that's what we're aiming to do here. So our goal is to have the toolkit available uh, in January at the latest so that once that legislative session uh, is underway, people are armed. <laughs> Uh-oh, shouldn't use that word probably, but <laughs> people have what they need to be able to contact their legislators. We do have a couple questions. I see that Andrea has her hand raised and then we'll go to Phil. Um, just a quick reminder, if, if we are going to in some way talk with our electeds to consider CDBG grants, because that, that money can probably go to a lot of those providers. So just a note. I okay. believe those funds are very specific for jurisdictions. Wynn, can you weigh in on that? Yes, I, I'd be happy to. Um, you have to be of a certain size or, in essence, a certain dollar amount to be able to receive uh, CDBG grants. And I think, I mean, in a lot of cases, I think they are um they are used for um infrastructure or uh affordable housing that kind of thing so i'm i'm not sure i i bet there's a different type of grant but those it's are two no different way. in cdbg those are two different infrastructure yes. and services are two parts of cdbg i know centennial gives money to project angel heart and nourish meals on wheels. So okay. that's something we can encourage when we talk to electeds. That's CSBG, that's Community CS. Services. Okay. Grant. No, it's D, CDBG. Well, There's I'm on the board for Jefferson County and, and we have a board for S CSBG, Community, community Services. services. Yeah. And, and for example, Lone Tree and Castle Pines in Douglas County are too small to receive those I'm grants, that uh, but they do go uh, to the county. So it might even be worth uh, talking with the county. Um, and I believe those. when um, some counties, including Douglas, opt out sometimes. But it's a great suggestion, Andrea. I think we'll we will dig further into that. Thank you, thank you, Win. Uh, uh, Kelly, yeah. thank you, Carrie. Uh, Kelly, quick comment on working with our contractors. Mm -hmm. I would expand um, the folks that you would look to uh, help advocate to include folks that may have been re. re due to the lack of funds may have not become contractors, but have applied for funding uh, because they're the ones that are sometimes on the fringe. Uh, so anyone that has applied and um, you may want to uh, also work with the other AAAs to take their lists and include them uh, as well. And, um, you know, it's it's the folks that didn't receive the funding that have probably been hurt more uh, than the folks that have received funding. Thanks. Noted. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. Any other questions or comments for Kelly? Thank you, Kelly. We look Here. forward to seeing more. Carrie, I just wanted to um, answer a question that Andrea had about meeting on the second Friday of December. Uh, the reason why we can't meet on the second Friday is we can't have all our information all together to prepare for the Dr. Cog board um, things that need to be out. That's why we chose the first Friday. Thank you, Mindy. That's I didn't see that question. Thank you. Okay. It's hard to get everybody's schedule. Um, on the same calendar sometime. All that's right. Nice time of year. Y yes, that's right. AJ, would you like to update us on things you've been working on? Uh, sure. 
Thank you. Um, well, still good morning, everybody. Um, let me... Eight more minutes anyway. Yeah, right. <laughs> still technically true. Um, I'm new to sharing in Zoom, so give me a second here. Oops. Um, sorry, I thought this was all set up. Uh, can you all see that? Mm -hmm. There you are. Okay. Thank you. All right, so I'm here to uh, talk to you all about uh, some of the work I've been doing um, for the past little bit, uh, and that is to uh, develop uh, what's called a community care hub. Um, <laughs> it's been relatively easy, and that's relatively, not easy, but relatively, um, because of the work that uh, all of you do and Sharon and Jayla did uh, for many years before I started doing this. And I'll get to that in a second. But as a brief overview, uh, a community care hub is a community-based organization that um, organizes and manages a network of community-based provider. And it does this so it can, it can be, in essence, a one-stop shop for healthcare or health insurance companies or others to work with in a region um, to uh, address their patients or members what they call social needs. So do they need housing? Do they need transportation? Uh, do they need um, health literacy or navigation services? Um, whatever uh, that uh, potential uh, partner needs, um, the community care hub can offer because of its strong ties to the local service providers. And it can do that in an efficient manner um, because it uh, is used to managing a network. Um, and that network uh, is defined as a coordinated group of uh, trusted CBOs led by a hub. Um, and you'll see in a minute, uh, it is very similar to what we do already, but I wanted to kind of level set this. These two definitions came from a lot of work done at the national level with um, the Administration for Community Living, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, um, and an organization called the Partnership to Align Social Care, uh, which I'll get to in a minute. I should also stop here and say, I can't see very many of you. So if any of you have questions, please just interrupt me because I think many of you know I can talk forever. Um, so feel free to interrupt if you have any questions. Okay, uh, I've been alluding to this a little bit, but um, here's a comparison of what uh, the role of a area agency on aging and a community care hub with an affiliated network. Uh, the, this is a comparison. So as an area agency on aging for the Denver region, uh, we serve older Coloradans as required by the Older Americans Act. Uh, as a community care hub and network, we will serve people in our region referred by insurance and healthcare organizations. As an area agency on aging, we receive and provide stewardship of federal and state funds. As a community care hub and network, we will receive and provide stewardship of contracted funds. Um, as an area agency on aging, we deliver Older Americans Act services through an accountable network of community-based organizations. And as a community care hub and network, we will deliver contracted services through an accountable network of community-based organizations. Um, and I think this is a really important um, visual for everyone to, to see uh, how similar uh, a community care hub is to an area agency on aging. Uh, I actually shared this slide with the um, State Unit on Aging Director of Georgia, who uh, the uh, ACL connected me with, because they are um, going to uh, strongly encourage their 12 area agencies on aging in that state uh, to form community care hubs. Um, and they thought this slide was um, particularly helpful in um, explaining uh, a community care hub. Okay, so... How did this um, model, if you will, the, CC, the Community Care Hub evolve? Well, uh, uh, you might all remember uh, it's this uh, October is the anniversary of my 10th year at Dr. Cog. Um, I came as part of the uh, Community Care Transitions Program, CCTP. Uh, Jayla hired me to be a care transitions coach. Um, and that program was fairly successful nationally in helping Medicare uh, beneficiaries avoid an unnecessary 
uh, hospital readmission. And then in 2014, the YMCA of uh, the National Office of the YMCA uh, got a demonstration project with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. Uh, and they found that they could implement diabetes prevention programs through their YMCA affiliates, but the national office acted as the contracting arm and managed the quality assurance and implementation of the diabetes prevention programs at YMCAs across the country. And that was a lesson about um, centralizing the administrative tasks. Um, and the CCTP program was a lesson uh, that community-based organizations, specifically area agencies on aging, can have a big impact on healthcare cost and, and outcomes. Um, and I hope uh, all of you remember the accountable health communities model as fondly as I do. Uh, I should say fondly now that it's over. Um, but that was a, a model uh, that we uh, operated here in Denver and was um, also uh, implemented in 31 other communities across the country. And it was the first time that CMS tested the impact of identifying and addressing social needs like food, transportation, um, housing. Uh, how do those needs, when addressed or not addressed, impact healthcare cost and outcomes? Um, and we found here in Denver that they uh, lowered emergency department visits and increased primary care, which is exactly what you want. And that was uh, the kind of the progenitor of the hub model because Dr. Cog, in our implementation, acted as the bridge organization. So we contracted with everybody and we made sure that, uh, or we tried to make sure that things were going uh, well and um, meeting the terms and conditions of the funding. And then finally, and most recently, the Chronic Care Act um, allows Medicare Advantage plans to offer uh, special benefits to um, their uh, their members with chronic illnesses. Uh, they can use um, funding to pay for food and transportation, uh, health literacy classes, home modifications, things like that. Um, and they found that uh, doing that uh, improves um, their member satisfaction um, and they're starting to see that uh, healthcare costs are going down um, uh, due to it. Uh, but the studies are, are still, the jury is still out on that one. But all put together, you can see that working with area agencies on aging in the CCTP program showed promise. Um, developing a model where uh, one organization handles a lot of the administrative and implementation and project management functions was very successful as the YMCA demonstrated and so did the accountable health communities. And then adding additional funding for benefits like food and transportation um, provides that uh, that full um, uh, program to lower healthcare costs and outcomes for people um, who uh, have social needs. And I think I see a question. Um, no, just kidding. Okay. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, and I'll speed up here, um, uh, at the national level, uh, the Partnership to Align Social Care is work is funded by Robert Wood Johnson, United Healthcare and Kaiser Permanente, and many others. Um, and it is a, a partnership between um, organizations across the country, both Area Agencies on Aging, the Food is Medicine Coalition, uh, uh, representatives from the Administration for Community Living and Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, um, and multiple health insurance companies. Uh, and they're trying to figure out how they can best um, access community-based organizations to serve uh, healthcare and health insurance uh, patients and members. Um, the Administration for Community Living is a big um, uh, uh, fan of this model and they are pushing it quite, uh, quite thoroughly. Um, they are basing it on their experience uh, with many things, including their uh, No Wrong Door infrastructure grants. Um, and they uh, launched a learning collaborative and they're, they're pushing AAAs across the country to form community care hubs. Uh, and they've, uh, uh, we were part of the National Learning Collaborative in 2022. Uh, we took part in a year long um, uh, program where we met with other, uh, I met with other community care hubs that are forming across the country and working through some of the sticky issues like, um, how do you contract with a network? Uh, how do you have the HIPAA compliance and the privacy policies uh, to be successful? Um, 
I when I first saw this map, this was this is a map of the participants, and you'll notice that many of them are statewide implementations, uh, and that is by design. Um, and I uh, chuckled uh, when I first saw this map because it's it's like there we are in the Mountain West, uh, just our eight counties doing it all by ourselves, um, and I'm pretty proud of that. But also, it's a problem because uh, if we're the only one in the state of Colorado, uh, it makes it a lot harder for us. Uh, to be successful. So I'm hoping there will be other AAAs that form community care hubs uh, in the coming months. Um, and this is happening. This is being pushed by CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. They want everybody in Medicare and, and traditional, uh, excuse me, traditional Medicare and Medicaid in a, uh, what they call an accountable care relationship, which means they'll pay for outcomes and not fee for service. And they're also pushing health equity quite a bit which means um, in, in healthcare, uh, addressing health-related social needs or things like food, transportation, utilities. Um, and so they're really driving this activity of all the Medicare Advantage plans um, and the, the healthcare providers to, uh, to find ways to address their patients and members' social needs. Um, ever since then, and this is where uh, a lot of the work I've been doing has, is coming into play, um, uh, I do sit on the Partnership to Align Social Care is one of their work groups, um, and they are uh, actively um, implementing, um, they're working with CMS to implement new billing codes so that uh, community-based organizations can bill for services delivered. That's a long way off, but they're, we're working on it. Um, they've also designed the, the idea of what a community care hub could be. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the ACL launched the National Learning Collaborative, the second uh, iteration of that. The applications are out now. Um, and just recently, the um, U.S. Aging Business uh, Institute received $11 million to for, from the Administration for Community Living uh, to fund a center of excellence to promote the um, uh, adoption and implementation of community care hubs. And they're going to be um, issuing uh, an RFP uh, that I hope we can apply for soon uh, to help us implement a no wrong door like system in uh, in the Denver region. Um, and uh, one of the more um, exciting opportunities is that the new Medicare physician fee schedule creates um, two new opportunities for uh, specifically area agencies on aging and community care hubs. They were called out in the fee schedule proposed rules. Um, to bill for um, assisting um, Medicare beneficiaries, both in Medicare Advantage, their special needs plans and traditional Medicare. So hopefully in uh, 2025, we'll be able to partner with healthcare uh, to bill Medicare for the navigation component of delivering those services. Um, that benefit is, uh, one of the benefits is called community health integration. Uh, and the exciting thing is, is that the, um, well, I'll get to that in a minute. And then finally, the uh, state of Colorado is issuing an RFP shortly uh, to fund some regional hubs, as they call them, to help deploy um, uh, the social health information exchange, which some of you have heard me talk about, where they'll be able to send referrals from healthcare to community-based organizations. And uh, this uh, kind of came out of left field, but they decided to break that funding up and they awarded a statewide contract and soon they will be issuing an RFP for regional hubs uh, to work with community-based organizations to implement that technology side of things. All right. All right, uh, where are we here? Okay, so uh, this, I'm, I'm almost done, I promise. Um, this slide will tell you what do we need as a hub and network to operate um, effectively? Well, we need technology to receive digital referrals from healthcare organizations. And we have that. Um, we have a simplified version and the uh, social health information exchange will help us make that a more robust technology solution. At both our, at Dr. Cog and uh, at our uh, contracted partners, there are staff who can help clients navigate um, to get the services they need. We have uh, technology at Dr. Cog uh, and at our contracted sites to document client interactions, record time spent, 
um, report, uh, make reports and send uh, client information back to healthcare organizations. As many of you know, we just launched a closed loop referral platform. Um, and we have most importantly, um, almost 50 years of experience working in the community uh, and a, a network of providers that are very skilled in delivering services. And as I mentioned earlier, the I'm standing on the shoulders of Jayla and Sharon and many people um, at Dr. Cog who helped uh, our network gain the cyber and other insurance and the security policies that make it possible for us to partner with health insurance companies specifically. They want to know the information we have is secure and that the uh, privacy of their members is respected. And then finally, we have experience with healthcare contract negotiation, um, and we will shortly gain uh, experience with billing and reimbursement. Um, keep checking to see if there's any um, questions. So it's not a given that all of our contracted partners will want to be a part of this hub, but I hope they do. Um, and I, the reason I hope they do is because uh, we're, we're gonna be much better together. Uh, we can offer the full range of community-based services uh, to healthcare organizations. We can reach the whole region together, but separately we're limited in our reach and both our, uh, physically and the services we offer. Um, if we can work together uh, in the hub and network, we can keep our administrative costs low um, in, as opposed to separately each of us negotiating contracts with healthcare organizations and implementing new programs that would be expensive. Um, and also if we can uh, work together, we can serve more people. Um, and if we're competing against each other, then we're going to be uh, missing out on funds we might otherwise receive uh, because we're competing against each other. But if we work together, we have a much better chance of success. All right, so the upcoming opportunities that I talked about, um, uh, shortly in the next coming, um, what I think are weeks, uh, the US Aging uh, Disability Institute will um, be releasing the RFP for about $500,000 over three years to help us finalize our uh, no wrong door system. The governor's office of eHealth Innovation, as I mentioned, is going to be issuing an RFP for community or for regional hubs. And uh, the most exciting opportunity we have is the Health Equity Learning Collaborative. Um, that's uh, the application should be released either today or early next week. And that is uh, a learning collaborative that'll take place through uh, 2024 that we hope to be a part of that will gather together health insurance companies, health systems, healthcare providers, and a community care hub to design a model of care uh, to then uh, utilize the new Part B benefit, the community health integration. Um, I was a little intimidated when I heard a new model of care, um, but really it's just a program, uh, as we would call it. How do we access these funds as a community care hub? How can we um, work together with the health insurance companies uh, and the healthcare providers to serve their patients and get paid for that um, experience? Uh, and so that uh, will begin in January. Uh, the learning collaborative will take place uh, throughout the year, the 2024, and the plan is then to implement in 2025 and have contracts um, signed with that consortium of, of partners uh, to deliver that model of care or program in the region. Uh, and I'm actively recruiting um, organizations to join us in that application. Um, and that is it for me. Are there any questions? You have several comments, I think, in the chat, AJ. Oh, okay. Sorry, I missed them. AJ, I may not have stated mine all that well, but longer term, um, having folks realize that this is all of our dollars that are funding all of this, whether we're talking about health insurance or Medicare Advantage or um, CMS dollars. Uh, it's all our dollars. Yes, it is. And the more we can promote healthy living as well, not just health care. Yes. Uh, health care is on the back end. And I didn't know whether uh, 
what you're talking about will have room for promoting uh, elements of healthy living as well as this awareness uh, because France is the only place where there's a social benefit program that isn't bankrupt. And uh, the reason why is they've lived through multiple generations of this so that folks realize it's community payment for community benefit. And I have a personal responsibility to the community to do the best I can for my health. Um, and so that's kind of my way of saying, uh, is, is there an element or room for uh, dealing with that in the program as well? Yes. So uh, as, as you're all aware, we provide Older Americans Act services as required by the Older Americans Act. But when we have a new funder or partner, um, the community care hub is designed to be flexible so that it can address the stated needs of, of that funder or that population. Um, and so that could be a, a range of things. And uh, I hate telling you this, especially because you're an actuary and have so much experience with insurance, but as we move away from fee for service and the, uh, there's a lot of momentum in, in Colorado and nationally to move towards a more primary care centric model instead of a specialist and uh, hospital centric model of care in the country. Um, the goal is to move towards that wellness state um, and it move towards prevention. And that's what we hope to be a, a part of. Thanks. When? Thank you. Yes. And I think you've kind of touched on this, AJ, but I'm not entirely clear on how the finances would work. Is it that we, by becoming becoming uh, a community um, hub network um, would get some of the Part B premium and that would benefit us because we're already serving some of these people and that would be making our money go further? Um, almost. Okay. So uh, <laughs> uh, it's... Uh... We wouldn't be getting part of the premium. The the benefit the two new benefits they've created are a payment for social needs screening. So a healthcare provider under Part B would uh, be able to bill for the time they spent screening one of their patients. And then under the community health integration, we could provide services, navigation type services, not direct services uh, to address needs, um, staff time to help that patient. Um, uh, get to the community-based organization. Um, and then uh, the, the problem then becomes, how do we pay for the service? But for the first time, we'll be able to access the billings, the, the, the benefits of Medicare Part B. So as we bill for our services, we wouldn't bill Medicare directly. That's where the partnership with the healthcare organization comes in. So they refer to us we work with the client or the patient and those hours are compensated. Um, and my hope is that we can get enough of a, of a volume um, to be able to build up a, a, an amount of funding to pay for services out of that. But we can also uh, share those referrals with our network who would then be paid for um, providing that navigation service. So there's, it's the first time there's funding available for community-based organizations and the the fee schedule, the Medicare fee schedule, um, calls out area agencies on aging and community care hubs specifically. So they're hoping that healthcare partners with us um, to do this. So there are other, if I can, there are other efforts uh, to create billing codes for community-based services. Yes. So absolutely. this is the 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 first step, right? And and uh, CMS and lots of folks are working on developing billing codes and a process for paying for things like transportation, nutrition. It's within the next, I think, three to five years that we'll see this come down. But those players that are already in the door are gonna have those opportunities first, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's why ACL is strongly pushing us, the administration on community and let me strongly pushing us to get in this space because they know, and they've been saying this for more than a decade, 
the the federal and the state funding isn't going to keep pace with the growth of older uh, of the older adults in in the nation. So you have got to look at partnering with healthcare and health payers to help supplement some of these services and to help meet the needs in your community. And so I have been in conversations at the national level with CTAC about these other, so the things that are on the top of the list is transportation, nutrition, advanced directives, um, uh, disease prevention, and case management. Those are the things that people are talking about right now. They're talking about medical case management, not so much the type that we do, but they don't know how valuable ours is yet. Um, they will find that out very soon as they start getting into that world. If you don't have someone to help with those applications, you're not going to get the services that you need. And you can't get services if you don't have housing. And if you don't have transportation, um, it doesn't matter if you're, if the medical tech person comes in, if you don't have those things, you're not going to, or food, it doesn't really matter. So, um, and thanks, yeah, Shayla. And the other side of that is the um, SSBCI supplemental benefit for uh, chronically ill. That was part of the Chronic Care Act, and that is a law. Um, and it's way inside baseball to say how Medicare Advantage plans can offer those benefits. Um, but my hope is that uh, as we go through this learning collaborative process, the partners we develop will make those benefits a part of their um, Medicare Advantage plan to their um, members. And then we could then be paid for the service. So the transportation, the meals, the home modification, um, whatever the insurance company is authorized to provide through that act, the Chronic Care Act. Um, and that's what's um, another side of what's exciting about this is that we can get uh, funding for the the tasks to get the person enrolled in the service and then get the service on a limited basis paid for uh, for those uh, referred members, patients, clients, whatever you want to call them. AJ, so yeah. just so that I understand a little clearer, on the, the beginning of this, would it be Dr. Cog's staff doing those screening questions? I think you would mention that. So through the, the new Medicare benefit, uh, um, it will probably be the healthcare partner who's doing that and referring them to us through the technology we have, um, the, the referral system we have. And then we would um, identify you know, the right partner to work on that. And that's part of the development process we need to go through of like, which organization is interested in doing what and has capacity and um, you know, whatever the criteria is but the reason it's a it's important to be a hub if you will is um many insurance companies are more interested in statewide and national uh, um, implementations and so if we can work together um it's easier for an insurance company to contract with dr cog who manages you know eight transportation providers mm -hmm. um because then we're their transportation provider and there's not the if one drops out they're not necessarily too concerned but if they have one transportation provider and they're, they close, that is a huge bureaucratic mess for the Medicare Advantage plan. But also we can work together. So maybe um, VIA provides the first leg of a ride and a little helper provides the second. Um, however, we work that out just as, uh, and then we're, as I said, we're better together. And so that makes sense. And so this would be different than what Kaiser is already doing giving six rides a month for or six rides a year or what is it Ada a year oh Ada you're muted you're muted Ada Ada you're muted it's it's six round trips 12 one-way trips per so it's six round trips Per, yeah, year per year or per quarter? Year. Year. So yeah. it would be then on top of that, we would be able to. They would still get those benefits, but then this would allow the hub could then bill for additional trips or whatever. 
Yeah, Eventually. if that's what Kaiser yeah. prefers. Or we could start providing those trips and additional trips. Yeah. Um, it's a good start. I see what you're yeah. saying. I was yeah. a little confused at first. It so is, it's hard to get your head around it, right? And yeah. um, it, it's just building upon what we've already been doing for the last decade. Um, you, you know, ever since AJ started, we've been kind of building and learning and learning and getting things in place so that we could be positioned well. I think we'd be further along had the pandemic not ha happened. You know, nationally, we've been further along. Um, but we were still building during that time. And so I think that's been a benefit to us. I'm really hoping that all of this work will bring the whole goal has always been bring more money so that we can pay for more services and help more people in this region, bottom line. And we, we would certainly start it, but we need to have those partners to collaborate with and there, if it's a big system, we couldn't handle, you know, we might contract the navigation out or we would contract a portion of the navigation out because that's it. I mean, we have a navigator working in Denver Health. It is an interesting day every single day um, <laughs> and challenging. Um, that's not easy stuff. That is not easy stuff to do that. Um, so, and we've I had wondering. experience, yeah. I just was wondering on the impact of Dr. Cog's staff from the front end is what I was curious how that would all, would you need to hire more staff to, to implement? You know what, one of the things I was thinking of, as you know, I was talking with Adventists um, in your area to partner with you. What mm -hmm. an interesting opportunity that might be. Adventist, you as the hub organization in that area. Um, we need a model for that, same way in Jefferson County, um, Seniors Resource Center and Lutheran, um, they already have a partnership. Could we expand it um, through a model like this? Is there an opportunity in Adams County to do this? We wanna understand how those, those hub or that those models, those partnerships can expand services in certain territories. Um, we've been doing this for a while. AJ spent the last year getting a lot of information and training and meeting with national people to understand what's happening. Um, and if we can, I mean, in 10 years, have, have these many service hubs, these many partnerships, do you know what I mean? Um, but we got to start it. Yeah. No, thank you. That makes sense. Yeah. Did anybody else have questions or need clarification? Ed, Ed said in the chat, um, he was wondering, could community-based exercise programs like Silver Sneakers potentially be part of the structure? So programs like Silver Sneakers? Absolutely. Um, uh, I'll ask Doug and Jayla to open a gym in the bottom of the <laughs> but, but no, uh, honestly, those types of programs are exactly what we're talking about when there's a benefit that, uh, or, or a program or a model of care that could improve outcomes and make people healthier or help people be healthier. Um, the, uh, the insurance company may not know how to design and implement it, but we would. And as a, a known partner, they would come to us and say, here's what we need. And we could gather the appropriate group of uh, network partners and design and implement a program that would be affordable and match the, the benefit um, that they're looking so, for. So Ed, in the case of Broomfield, right? So we already have programs in Broomfield going. We have a partnership with Broomfield um, uh, Senior Center Recreation Center. Um, we would understand what the health payer wanted and then we would go to you and say, hey, the health payer is really interested in this. You already have those programs going. They would be interested in maybe one more. Could you start that up? And then we could pay for that, right? Having these partnerships already in existence um, and the ability to go quickly 
is something we're hoping that the 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 health payers, the insurance companies, um, will will see as a benefit. And, and it's interesting. I just talked with a rec center that does silver sneakers, and they indicated they they lose money for offering that program. It's it's so. Would this then hopefully? offer additional money yeah i think it would be additional yeah. so right so so maybe um maybe that would help them stay at least whole instead of losing money i mean they're committed to doing it because it is a good program it's a wellness program it's a preventative program but the bottom line is they lose money for offering so, same, same the same concept with fall prevention right fall prevention is big deal and for yeah. health payers um and having those partnerships so could we in addition to healthy moves to aging well and nimble have another fall prevention or balance program but it not be through maybe be through a health system but or maybe be through ymca or the community center or whatever it is um, there's a lot of programs, you know, around Parkinson's disease that that have extra specific exercise programs. It's all about what those those pairs want as a quality, as an outcome, right? What do yeah. you want to see? And, and so, if you want to see fewer falls, then give it. Then we will work with our community-based providers to implement these programs in our community with the community-based resources that we have okay and i think it's helpful to to think about this a little differently than we currently do um through the the older americans act programs it's not about what's authorized and what's allowed it's how can we rely on our expertise as community-based organizations working together to solve problems that make things better for the people we serve and the health insurance companies and the healthcare providers will always have ideas and, and hopefully they'll come to us and say, we want to lower A1C by, you know, outlawing cigarettes. I don't know, whatever it is. And we will say, well, how about we design a program of health literacy and helping people to shop better or whatever can lower A1C. We can have a give and take and design programs, but the, the core of what we're relying on is the technology that we have that is ahead of everyone else. And more importantly, that expertise and knowledge of the community and how to work with people effectively in their homes at, at where they're at. Um, and that's the big struggle that healthcare has is they have to do the things that are required um, by their quality measures, by their reimbursement. We can design programs that work for people and, and hopefully get those paid for um, to improve those outcomes and create wellness. Um, that's a very aspirational way to put it, um, but it's more flexible than we're used to. And we just got to trust ourselves that we can figure it out together. That's great. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Is there, Mindy, are there questions in the chat? Um, da, uh, Phil has, uh, he, he says, eventually it would be good to build greater healthiness across the older Colorado community as well. Wouldn't it be great to get some folks with the bully pulpit to assist? And would co-spaces with older Colorado and, and preschool slash primary grade youth be supported? Sure. Um, uh, I agree with everything you said, Phil, and I've, I've uh, always marveled at those programs you see where the uh, preschool is in the long-term care facility. Um, that would be awesome to have. Those are nice. Well, and even things like universal playgrounds so mm -hmm. that grandparents could utilize exercise equipment when they take their grandkids to the playground. And in fact, the city of Lone Tree is doing a revisioning and they were asking us about those kinds of things that they could implement into new parks. And so that's pretty cool. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, I guess I would just leave you with the the motivation to do for healthcare and health insurance. It's not a, a sales pitch that that anybody has to give the organization. It's being driven by CMS and and uh, payers at the national level. 
Um, and then it's important to have the community care hub because as much as I want to tease my coworkers at Dr. Cog, all the work that could potentially come from this isn't going to fall on any one organization. It's going to be shared. Uh, and so will the benefits. And it, again, it's just about being flexible um, and relying on our expertise. Okay. And Thank being reliable. And reliable. That's and we've showed that you know triple A's have shown that we've Dr. Croc has been in existence for almost fifty years. Um, we weather the storms and we will weather the storms ahead and we will be um, dependable partners. Absolutely, proven track record for sure. Okay, thank you, AJ. That was a lot for us to think about. Thank you. Um, well, let's go to the report from our Dr. Cog board members. Steve? Hello, good afternoon. Uh, a couple of things for you. At our most recent board meeting, a lot of, of uh, important things for us to deal with, but things that don't necessarily uh, relate to, to this group. Uh, in regards to some transportation plans, some of those things, improving some updates. Uh, we did at the last meeting, both uh, Jayla and I bragged on how great our last live in-person meeting was and how awesome it was to actually be around a table and and uh, you know what we did there. So again, just awesome to have seen you all. Um, earlier this month, we also had our Dr. Cog Awards. So I got to see text twice in the same month although I, I really haven't had a conversation. So checks at some point, we need to, to sit down and have a conversation. Um, kind of stemming out of, of our live in-person meeting, one of the things I said and, and advocated for, I also shared with the Dr. Cog board, that we need to have younger advocates of aging issues. And so I talked to our electeds about that, that if they have people in their communities that are very good with talking about aging issues that rep represent a, a younger generation, I still believe that can help us with cutting through and helping people understand uh, the issue that, that um, you know, just the more the more people from different vantage points that are talking about that that funding cliff, that are talking about the reality of changing demographics, all of those things are incredibly helpful for us. Uh, and then finally, our next uh, workshop for Dr. Cog, we are excited about uh, something is happening that didn't happen last year, and we're hoping it's going to be helpful. The governor's office is going to talk to us about their plans for the housing bills coming up this legislative session. That's mm -hmm. something that didn't happen a year ago. And so we are very excited to have that opportunity to hear from them, for them to hear from us. Uh, and so that will be coming up, and, and we're excited about that. That that nexus of housing and transportation and aging, uh, you know, all of those things come together. But as Dr. Cog continues to work on a regional housing strategy, it, it, it's good that we're at the table, the virtual table, uh, in a couple of weeks uh, dealing with with that issue. That's when and oh, sorry, Carrie. No, I was just going to say that's great that you are going to have a seat at that conversation because I know that didn't happen last time. And I do have to say, you did a great job at the award Selim, yes. Grace and Steve. You did a great job. And it was so fun to see everybody. Thank you. Thank you for being there. When did you have anything? I, you know, um, I would add something more local, <laughs> um, if I may. Um, sorry for being late today. I was at the Lone Tree Arts Center where we graduated our 11th class of volunteers from Wellspring. And it occurs to me that certainly for different reasons, uh, but seniors and the Wellspring community um, have shared uh, needs uh, for transportation, uh, you know, challenges living alone, um, finding things to do that give personal satisfaction and that purpose in life. So um, I always love to go to these and, uh, and see what they're willing to bring to the table as volunteer ushers and certainly our city benefits, but our, our patrons benefit as well. So just a plug for, uh, you know, kind of compassion 
on this Friday awesome. afternoon before the snow. <laughs> and I actually have the the Lone Tree Art Center uh, brochure with me. Uh, <laughs> got to got to see that fairly recently, and what a what a phenomenal building too. Oh yes, and you know uh, you bring that up uh, the Spark Alliance that we have programs for. Um, uh, uh, individuals who may be uh, suffering from Alzheimer's, um, great programs that are really focused on uh, bringing them some enjoyment, kind of bringing up the memories that they have uh, to uh, when when it's harder to think about what happened yesterday. You can always remember what happened 20 years ago and uh, it's it's a wonderful program as well. Thanks, it's Stephen. You were great to be there for CML. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that's a wonderful event center in Lone Tree. And the Spark program, I think music sometimes really yes. evokes memories and feelings. And so that's pretty special. All right. I know that Tex had something he wanted to talk about, and then we'll see. Um, I think we've got the county reports. Thank you. Um, we've several times mentioned the fact about the uh, September meeting and then kind of passed it by. And um I, for one, thought that that was one of the most useful meetings we've had in years. We uh, not only got to see each other, which was a great pleasure, but we got to be together. We got to associate. We got to do things that recognize, we recognized that others were doing and what they could do. And the meeting itself, I thought was much more useful. The Kelly's comments reflect what happened at that meeting. Uh, and, and I think it will make an enormous difference on what the presentations that we will be given by January will be because of the meeting. So one of the background issues related to having in-person meetings has to do with serving meals, which costs a great deal of money, a great deal of money. I believe that having meals at the meetings, in-person meetings, is not necessary. And also then changes the discussion on when we, how often we should have the meetings. If the costs are low, then there's less reason not to have more meetings together. Is it important or why is it important that we have fixed meals at those meetings? I believe that's not the case. And I believe that in, in our meetings, if we provide a period of time, which we do anyhow, toward the end of the meeting to say, all right, is there's a half hour now for conversation and to eat if you think brought something along, that would serve the purpose. If people wanna bring food, bring food. If they don't wanna bring food, we can discuss during that same period. So I would like to see that we give serious consideration to not having the requirement of food provided for those meetings. Jayla, is that in fact a requirement? Is Mr. Rex on the phone or on the call? It's not a requirement. Um, Tex would like to have more in-person meetings. He and I had a conversation and I said, one of the challenges with, especially going into the next year, right? One of the challenges of in-person meetings is the cost of parking um, at Dr. Cog, because I pay for the parking. Um, I don't certainly don't want you all to pay 20 bucks to park there um, and the cost of meals. 
And as we were discussing, because, you know, it could be, I don't know, uh, $700 nowadays to um, uh, have a meeting. Um, and I have an interest in reducing um, expenditures, right? Especially going into the next, the next uh, year. Um, Tex and I talked about, well, we didn't have to necessarily have it at Dr. Cog. We could have it at places around the region that are free. Um, and then we talked about the meal cost and he suggested that maybe we didn't need to have food. And that's just been something that has always been done my entire time at Dr. Cog. We have, it's not a requirement, but that's what we've done, right? Um, is, is to have lunch uh, at, at, at those meetings. Well, we saved three years worth of, of food costs during the pandemic, because I know for as long as I have been a member, which has been a while now, believe it or not, um, we met every month in person and they were even, I want to say they were longer meetings even. They, they were. were like four hours. They were. And I, I mean, I'd like to hear from Doug on, on the food and the parking and all, but I, I have to agree with tax is that there's something very valuable about meeting in person. I'm not saying we do it every time. And I'd love to hear what others think, but, but that was really valuable in my opinion. Doug? Madam Chair, if I may. Um, no, I thank you. And I, I appreciate the comments related to um, the importance of, of that personal interaction in, in uh, in-person meetings. Um, as you may or may not know, or the, or the committee may know that the, uh, that the executive committee were pretty resonant about um, the Dr. Cog board continuing to meet in person. Um, so they are at their monthly business meeting are participating in person. I would be a, an advocate myself of, of having more meetings in person, whether that be quarterly, it doesn't have to be monthly, right? Maybe it's quarterly, right? And we decide on what those dates are. Um, I'm, I'm less concerned than JL about parking now because I think we can we can comp that we can we provide validation and simply because um, you know in our lease agreement that we have with the building um, we factored in the board work sessions um, uh, and and those board work sessions are no longer in person and we don't expect they will be for for an extended period of time so so we have additional parking validation opportunities and and we'd be happy to share that with uh, with the ACA. And with regards to meals, I mean that's really, you know, I mean it's up to you all really. We can meet earlier so that we're not bridging a meal time or, you know, breakfast maybe is even is is I know is cheaper than lunch at times, so we could do something something simple like that, some continental type breakfast or whatever. So just just some thoughts. We have a lot of latitude and and but ultimately, it's at the discretion of this committee. Thank you so much for that, Doug. Um, what other thoughts from members on meetings? No, Kathy, Kathy has her hand up. Yep. So I, I wanted to know what people thought about meeting offsite to not be going downtown and to using the library so that, you know, maybe next month or next time it's in Lakewood at some place or whatever. But um, was that drive? Was that too far for folks? Was it the ease of parking helped overcome that? So I guess I'd just like to get a feel for the location when we went off site. I thought it was great. Yeah. Enjoyed seeing a different site. It wasn't, I mean, it was a drive, but a nice facility. And I thought it was really nice room. I thought it was great. I have to agree it. with Donna. It it was lovely. And the parking was so easy. I know the room was crowded, but so what? I liked I liked that location. I think, well, I, I think there's plenty of other library yeah. type of facilities mm -hmm. that we can meet in without spending meeting rooms. You know, I, I think downtown has become a challenge for everyone. And especially as you get into the winter months, it's not always where you want to be. But um, I just thought I'd see what others thought. So thank you for that feedback. Wynn, did you want to say something about the meetings offsite? Yes, I I actually like that location as well. And 
I think it felt very safe and easy to get into and out of. Uh, it It isn't close to public transportation, which is the downside, really, uh, unless there's a, a bus line that runs nearby. But, um, but I think uh, it was a great facility and uh, I didn't mind being crowded either. I, I, I don't anticipate that we'd stay in the same place. Um, Volunteers of America's new space has, uh, they've invited us to come up. I bet you we could get Chris Lynn to invite us to come to his shop. Um, you know, I think we could travel around and maybe even see some of our contracted partners, right? Um, mm -hmm. Oh, Steve. Uh, yeah, I, again, just found incredible value to being live and in person. The The challenge on that meeting was that the time was different than what I think a lot of us were used to with the calls. So we just need to be consistent with that. Uh, and I will, you know, after March, not be Dr. Cog chair anymore, but I hope to still be involved in this group. Uh, I do have a problem on Fridays being uh, around being at meetings too early because we have our community coffee every Friday morning that is time with our seniors that I find incredibly valuable and I like the consistency of always being able to be there. So if if we were to go earlier on a Friday live, that would pose some problems for me, but it's not about me. Uh, but I just thought I would share that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Any other? Commissioner Teal, did you want to weigh in on in-person? meetings you bet i mean i i liked the opportunity to get on uh to see people that i haven't seen for a long time face to face um golly you know you talk about if we want public transit to be a part of it i i kind of want to uh get with my friend and colleague win shaw and see if we couldn't get, twist some arms over at kiwit to uh, see if we could get them to offer a meeting space uh, where light rail um, practically deposits right at that door. Um, but uh, and then as far as uh, uh, the the cost associated with lunch, um, I, I would actually put it back to my fellow board members of Dr. Cog and uh, uh, ask. Are we sure that we couldn't uh, explore something with Doug and and the finance staff at uh, Dr. Cog to where um, maybe that is uh, a cost that is not necessarily borne by uh, Jayla's team, but something that is borne by Dr. Cog itself? Um, I got to say, uh, the idea of having a meal, I don't know about you guys, but uh, it's uh, the, peop the good people at Douglas County like keeping me busy. And so it was really nice to be able to show up and uh, sit down, uh, see everybody face to face, and know that I was not going to have to uh, miss the midday meal, which anybody who knows me knows <laughs> that I do like my meals. So I think those are my thoughts on the subject, Carrie. Oh, you cracked me Sharing up. a meal together, though, isn't there? It's something special. Breaking bread. It goes back yeah. to the beginning of time. So it it is something I think, um, Jayla, I don't know how you want to proceed on this. Maybe at our next um, executive meeting, we could really look at the calendar and give some more time because it sounds to me like there's such value in meeting in person and we okay. can figure it out. Yes, we can. We can figure anything out. I think so. I think so. And Aging Resources just might have a new meeting space that even has <gasps> nearby. Thought about that. I'd we have to go up north sometimes, though. Or Come to, on now. Or to top. <laughs> so, yes, and we will go up north. Absolutely. <laughs> so, thank you for bringing that up, Tex. I think that that was a really valuable discussion. A pleasure. Thank you. Um, as always, text brings such wisdom to the conversation, and I appreciate that. So, oh goodness, I wish more people were here. <laughs> <laughs> well, Doug is here. He's hearing it. <laughs> okay. 
All right. I already knew, Tex. Yeah. He, he knew that. I do have, um, since we're, we've been talking about, uh, in a different context, aging, uh, I'm 90, I will be 92 uh, in a couple months, have a handicap, know so many people who have passed on, know so much about seniors, and I'm concerned kind of about the way we talk about seniors, and, and I would like us to find a way for a short presentation about the changing life of seniors. I mean, you, everybody is a um, proud, authoritarian, recognize their skills and everything until you retire. And once you retire, it quickly disappears because the friendships change, the ability to get things done change, and your sense of pride changes. It truly does because all of a sudden you don't know everybody. You don't know what's going on. The cue card, you know, that little new thing that we have now that we can subdivide and find out what information was that we used to be able to find out by reading, but now we have to take a picture to find out what it is. All of that stuff is not what useful is useful to seniors and seniors we change as we get older and i just would like the opportunity sometime and not necessarily for me to do it but to present a case for what happens to us as we age that we need to consider as we're younger when talking to older people, so many times I hear people saying, well, George, I understand that you used to know how to do that, you know, but we do change and it's a part of being a senior. And I just think it's something we ought to consider at some point making a small presentation on. End of observation. 100%, yeah. I love that idea. Wonderful. Yes. Very, very eloquently explained. That's awesome. Thank you so much. That's right. We will make sure that gets put on the agenda um, at a future date. I, I think that's a marvelous suggestion. Okay. County reports. Who would like to go first? George, did I see you raise your hand? <laughs> Commissioner? Yes, you did. <laughs> so. Well, so uh, based on uh, what Carrie was talking about, what's going on with aging resources of Douglas County? I don't know, Carrie, we can or we can't talk about our big new project. Let's talk. You tell me. Let's, Let's talk. talk about it. All right. Well, I don't want to steal too much of Carrie's thunder. As a matter of fact, she might pick up the second half of this uh, report. But yeah, um, uh, Carrie's found a phenomenal um, establishment to in in the city of Lone Tree to uh, take a good hard look at um, moving the base of operations of ARDC up into, and um, it's uh, it, it would just be a a huge change to the services I think that ARDC are able to provide. It hits upon a social gathering uh, aspect that I know uh, Carrie's been a big advocate of trying to find uh, for many years now, but more specifically, as we're doing our, um, our older adult uh, services initiative and we're doing our listening sessions around the county, having a social gathering place, having a place for social gatherings um, is something that keeps coming up over and over again. And um, and so, uh, yeah, the county is partnering up with Carrie and uh, Aging Resources of Douglas County 
to uh, look to uh, add this to um, as a as a new headquarters, as a new establishment for ARDC. And uh, we're very excited. She's got a lot of support from the board of county commissioners. But uh, Carrie, I'm going to let you talk about it from here on out and pass the report baton to you. Okay. This new space will give us the opportunity to not only continue programming in the northern tier of the county, and we may keep the our small Castle Rock office too for a southern um, presence, but it is a fully operational restaurant. And Grandma's Kitchen will be operating out of this restaurant, not only for social gathering, breaking bread together, you know, having that common meal, offering a space for support groups and sharing circles, and offering employment opportunities to older adults who need to make just a little extra to stay independent financially and in their homes. Having intergenerational opportunities, um, it, I'm really looking at this as a community gathering spot. It will be open to the public. We are not going to be serving just senior meals. It will be open to the public so that the community can come in and support the older community. All proceeds that are made from the restaurant will go back into programming. And that's our way of looking at local support and local dollars to further our operations. Um, I've learned a lot from Jayla and her team about looking for outside dollars so that we are not so dependent on our federal funding. Um, so we're pretty excited. And Commissioner Teal has really led the way in opening up these listening tours and really hearing what the older adults are telling us. We knew some of it, but we've had some surprises in there too and some challenges about what we can do better. This is our creative solution to hitting all of those, um, all those wish lists that we've been hearing from people. We've had tremendous support from the community and we're pretty excited to share it with all of you as we move closer. And there's only one thing to change with what Carrie presented, and that is the fate of the uh, current ARDC headquarters, the White House there in Castle Rock. Um, Carrie, we decided that actually that's going to become Commissioner Teal's uh, new office. So if anybody hears George Teal is headed to the White House, I'm not running for president next year. I'm just moving into the White House on 4th Street. It, no, I'm just kidding. No, <laughs> I'm just great. kidding. We're, we'll deliver we're gonna... lunch there. Oh, okay. Well, it's back on then. Okay. It, I'm, it, I'm not it is an there awesome, it is an awesome office. I love that space too. <laughs> it, it's a wonderful space. And I think the residents of Castle Rock have gotten very used to us being there. So I will talk to Commissioner Teal more about that. But, but anyways, excited to share with all of you. And I've talked to Win Shaw and we've got her support and Ada Anderson has been really a, a good vessel for advice for us. And so we're, we're very <laughs> grateful to our whole community. What other county reports? Anybody? I know somebody's got something going on besides <laughs> Douglas. No? Okay. Well, then I believe unless there's other matters that we need to discuss, we're ending right on time. Anything? Carrie, yes. I, I, I had to come in late. What did we decide about the next meeting? The next meeting will be on December 1st. And At what time? Be, uh, the same time. Mindy, did we say? At the same time. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yes. You are most welcome. Anything else? Thank you all for joining us. I love getting all the input from everyone. It's so valuable coming together and listening to all of you. So thank you. And I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Thanks, Carrie. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you. See y'all. Bye, -bye. Bye everyone.